Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's another episode of PC Archaeology. It's been a little while since I've had one of these, but today on the bench we have a MyTac PC with an Amdeck monitor and a matching keyboard. So, without further ado, let's take a look at what's going on inside this machine. As is normal for these PC archaeology videos, I don't know anything about the machine we're about to look at, so it may end up being a super boring video, or there might be interesting goodies inside the machine. As I mentioned in the intro, this is a MyTac PC here. It's got four five and a quarter inch drive bays, half height or two full height, which leads me to believe that this is an XT clone, just because the original XT would have had two exposed full height drives. We have an Amdec monochrome compatible monitor, and it's got the anti-glare cloth material over the CRT. And you can see here, that's the studio light that's sort of behind me. And it's actually doing a pretty good job cutting down the reflection. Problem is with this material, it's almost like the material that uh, pantyhose are made out of, is it collects a lot of dirt. It's very difficult to clean. You have to totally disassemble a monitor if you wanna take this off to properly clean it. And usually when you do, and I have other videos about this, the CRT that's underneath this, the glass, is usually really dirty and it darkens the picture quite a bit, which requires you to have to turn up the brightness and contrast just to get a usable image. So a lot of times these monitors are quite worn out when I get them because they've been driven so hard over their lifetime. And then there is this keyboard that was included with it. It's quite yellow. Um, it's an XT style layout. But interesting is when we flip it over here, it actually has an XT and an AT switch right there. So even though it's got the XT layout, it is possible to actually use this on a later machine. Now, it doesn't feel super great, but a lot of times these types of uh, metal constructed XT clone keyboards are actually mechanical of some type. But we'll take a look at that more in a second. So back when the original PC and the XT were being cloned, a lot of the original clones just looked exactly the same as the IBM. They just didn't have the IBM logo here. So at least MyTac tried to do things a little bit differently and uh, mix it up a little bit. You know, they added some grooves here, there's some grooves down here. They just sort of changed it up a bit. And I kind of like that. I think this is one of the more handsome looking clones that I've seen. Now, initially I had made an assumption that this floppy drive here was a TIAC, but I noticed that the LED is down here and it's square, which is not normal. TIACs typically have a rectangular LED up here in the corner. So this is probably some kind of a clone of a TIAC, or it's an early derivative that I'm just not familiar with. This machine does have a hard drive. It's gonna probably be MFM. Now, I don't think this is gonna be a Seagate hard drive because typically if it does, the LED is down in the corner or maybe it's on this corner. So this is probably a three and a half inch hard drive. Maybe it's a Western Digital. Let's see when we open the computer what's actually in here. The whole machine is in excellent shape. There's no scratches or anything on the entire case, no rust either, so that's pretty nice. We have the usual chonky XT power switch. Of course, IBM originated that in the original PC and everyone just sort of copied. Now looking at the back of this, what's interesting is the original PC had five expansion slots and the later XT had eight. But this machine, as you can see, only has six exposed cards. This is gonna be the monochrome and the printer card. Maybe that's the hard drive controller and the floppy controller. And these potentially are just blanks. There is a button right here, which is almost certainly the reset button, which would imply that this machine does just run at 4.77 megahertz. So a complete clone of the original PC or PC XT. Moving over to the left, we have the power supply and some labels. This is the exhaust. The fan is actually mounted on the top of the power supply, almost certainly. The IEC mains input with the IEC output, this would go to that Amdeck monitor. It actually has the correct connection to plug into this. So when you turn on the power switch that's right here, it will actually turn on your monitor as well. And here's the MyTac label, MyTac model number MPC160TS-D1. And here's the serial number, and you have to wonder, was this number in sequence, did it start at 100,000 and they made 4,051? Or is this really the machine number 104,051 to come off the assembly line? So I decided to do a quick search for MyTac to see what I could find out about the company. And I found this article in InfoWorld from March 9th, 1987, talking about XT compatibles. 
Remember that by 1987, the 286 was well out and established. There were loads of 286 clones, and the 386, I think, was either out or it was just around the corner. So XT machines, especially those like the original IBM that ran at 4.77 megahertz, were pretty slow. Well, look at this section right here. Most manufacturers now imitate the base specifications of the IBM 640K 130 watt power supply and eight expansion slots. But machines that run faster than the original XT are more the rule than the exception now. The article goes on to say there's really no reason to buy IBM anymore. And that's really because all of these clones are just functionally identical and 100% compatible with the original XT. So all software will work. And here's the comparison chart of XT compatible desktop systems. It does list the IBM XT right here. And look at that price. Uh, hard disk system is the second column. $3,480. What? Now, interesting is ITT made a clone that's nearly as expensive as IBM's. NCR also made a clone that was also $3,200. So you saved a, a couple hundred dollars at least, but wow. Anyhow, MyTech International is right here with the MPC 160T or 160TE at $1,400 or $2,100. The model we're looking at right now is the MPC 160 TS, not TE. So I'm not quite sure the difference there, but as you can see, both models here, especially the original T there is significantly less expensive than IBM's. For MyTech, it has footnote number eight, which down here includes 768K of RAM. Very interesting. We'll be taking a look inside the machine later and we'll see if that's the case. All right, and here's the section on the MyTech. It just says 8088-2 microprocessor is used in both models and it's switchable between eight megahertz and 4.77, and it includes a nine month warranty. A bit unusual, but that seems relatively generous. A lot of these say 90 days. I'm just scrolling through the rest of the article and there's actually like no performance benchmarks or anything. And weird is they just have another random bad looking picture of IBM XT right here. So <laughs> it's like filler or something like that. You can see these ads right here though, as we keep scrolling down the ANI PC2 uh, dual disk drives, 599 and turbo option available. And actually take a look at this. This is actually a 286 clone. It would be a massive step up from an XT and 1149 and it has no hard drive, but it really does show at the time when this article came out, prices were dropping dramatically. And unfortunately I'm not having any luck finding any pictures of the old MyTac XTs or like prices or anything like that. I find ads like this where it says MyTac XT or AT call. Here is an actual MyTac ad from 1989 though, but it looks like they've uh, upgraded to much more generic, but sort of 3D6 looking machines as well. The Paragon series 286. It's a 16 megahertz VGA power station. MyTac, when reliability is a decisive factor. Well, I think that's gonna be a little bit of foreshadowing for the rest of this video. Next, I'm gonna take the top cover off and just an observation that all of the original screws are installed on this. Every single screw on the back here is the same. It's sort of a larger type. So that means that whoever worked on this last at least put the screws back, or maybe this has never been worked on since it was manufactured. You just see a sea of gray, but we're looking down into the computer now, and I'm gonna slide the cover off and reveal the contents. All right, I'm back on the tripod because the camera is not wide enough angle to really get in the entire machine. So I'm gonna to have to use this angled view. I really, really need to get myself a wide angle lens for at least one of my cameras so I can get these big things on the bench in the shot completely. All right, so first off, what I'm noticing is that this machine is really, really clean inside. It's quite amazing. There is a little bit of dust. There's some on the disk drive right there on the motor. But overall, I'm really amazed at how clean this thing is. So I don't think this computer was ever really used very much. So with this floppy drive, which is almost certainly 360K, I can see why now I thought it maybe was a TAC, but then realized the LED placement was different. Look at this board here. This is a MyTac disk drive. So almost certainly this is a clone floppy drive, a clone of a TIAC. And one thing that I do find interesting is that on a TIAC drive, you can raise and lower the lever here with no disc in there. But this one seems to have some kind of an interlock mechanism or this thing is very jammed up. No, I'm pretty sure this has an interlock. So they actually improved it slightly compared to the TIAC design. Trying to move this lever even with no disc in there, it feels very gummed up. Like it's, there's a lot of resistance even just to move with this small amount. So this thing will probably need a little bit of a tear down or at least some lubricant to get that thing working properly. 
Here is the XT Clone power supply, and yeah, it's looking really, really clean. It's just a little bit of dust on the top, but that's about it. And notice I'm putting fingerprints here, but no one else has been inside this machine in forever. We have a Powertronic brand switching power supply. Next up is the hard drive, and I can tell right away without even moving these cables that this is a Miniscribe drive, and there it is. Miniscribe quality from the 30th of April, 1987. This Miniscribe drive looks familiar. I don't see an immediate part number. Usually their part numbers are written on the side of the drive, but I'm pretty sure this is a Type 2 drive, which means it is 20 megabytes in size. It has the same capacity and physical dimensions, uh, not just the size of the actual drive, but I meant the heads and cylinders internally as the Seagate ST225. And yes, indeed, I can confirm that this drive is not a brick. This is an actual hard drive. All right, moving on to the motherboard, we can definitely see that it's pretty boring. One thing that I can tell right away without really looking any further is that this is the hard drive controller here with these ribbon cables that go to the mini scribe, but there is no floppy drive connection on either of these cards, so it must be plugged into the motherboard. So unlike all the IBM early motherboards, at least, this actually has a little bit of integration on it, or it must at least. Either that or the disk drive is just not connected to anything. But judging by the fact that this machine doesn't look like it's been opened or touched in forever, I'm thinking that yes, the disk drive is definitely connected to the motherboard. This is probably gonna be a MyTech branded monochrome and printer card. Now down here it says mono slash graphic, and there it says printer slash non flicker. Reading around the edge here, certified to comply with the limits for class B computing device pursuant to subpart J of part 15 at FCC rules. This card has actually been FCC certified. And there it is, it's actually an FCC number right there, made in Taiwan. I'm sure I can look up that FCC ID there and we will see that this card is almost certainly made by MyTAC themselves. Now I'm looking for any brandy on the back of the board and there really is nothing. It just says Reliance V-O there. And on the front, we do have one jumper there, J2. It says printer, and there's an off uh, silk screen right there. That's nice. I mean, typically they usually write nothing. So the fact that it actually tells you that that turns off the printer, that's nice. And we have two socketed chips here as well. And then we have V1 and V2 jumper as well with it set to V2. Wonder if that has to do with like the character set maybe. This is probably the character ROM right here. Oh, and I'm noticing that these two socketed ICs are 4464, so two of these make 64 kilobytes, 8 bits wide. So that would be for the fact that this is going to be a Hercules compatible monochrome card, and Hercules cards typically have 64K for their high resolution monochrome graphics, that is. Alrighty, the next card here is the interface card for the hard drive controller. All right, well, this card looks a little bit different than I'm used to. It has this really large package here, which I assume is like a an inductor perhaps or something like that. You'll notice that the ICs on this card have date codes around 1987. And this card, which I forgot to look at, seems to be also, I see 8702 there. So yes, similar age, 1987 as well. So I have to say, I've never seen a hard drive controller that looks like this. Of course, it's an XT hard drive controller, so it'll have its own ROM BIOS, which will almost certainly be located at C800. And then we have these large 40 pin dip packages here. Under the cables, there is a connection here for the second control cable that would go to another MFM drive. You'd connect them both to the main 34 pin ribbon, but you do need independent uh, control cables to go to each drive. It does say right here, DTC 5150, is that a CI? And then it says Data Technology Corp with a little logo. All right, here's the motherboard for the MyTech. There's a serial number sticker here that matches the one on the back of the machine. So this is the original motherboard that came in this machine. Right off the bat, I noticed that this has three banks of memory here, and these are TMS 4256 chips. So 256K for eight of them, which would imply that this actually has 768K populated. And on most machines, like the original PCXT, you would have two banks of 256K, and then you have two more banks of 64K to give you a total of 640. But it's possible that that extra 128K that this has on it over like the PC actually maps into high memory that you could use, or maybe it shows up as EMS memory. I'm not exactly sure. My keen-eyed viewers may be noticing this right here, which is a BR2325 from Matsushita Electric Corporation. I think this is a rechargeable three volt lithium battery, but this also implies that this machine has a clock chip, which is fascinating. 
These typically don't leak. Even though they are rechargeable, they don't leak, but they do wear out. So I have no idea if this works. The fact that this is a BR or rechargeable battery means I can't obviously just stick in a regular CR2032 in here, not without adding a diode. You'll notice at this angle, this machine actually only has five expansion slots. This one here is just a blank you can't even use. I know it's not gonna be easy to see because it's under these wires here, but the CPU is an NEC part, but it's not a V20, it's an 8088-2. So this actually probably is a turbo machine. Although you could run this in a 4.77 megahertz machine and obviously it would work just fine. I'm moving it with my finger, but there is the floppy drive controller cable. So absolutely that is integrated into the motherboard as I had thought. And this button here almost certainly is the reset circuit on the back. Let's see if it's a momentary, it is. So this has a reset button. Why wouldn't they just put that on the front? Who knows? Everything else about the motherboard here looks pretty standard, like the power connector from the power supply. Nothing different going on. Obviously the only thing is there's some extra circuitry on here to support the floppy drive but I do not see any extra circuitry on here for serial ports or anything like that. There are no extra connectors, at least that I can see. Although a bunch of the motherboard is hidden under the hard drive, obviously. I'm even realizing here that there was an attempt to make some cable management, which I've messed up here, but these ribbon cables were nicely folded on top of the hard drive here, so it wouldn't impede airflow. But also, even these cables here are all zip tied together which is pretty nice. Like there's extra power connectors right here and they're not just loose, they're all tucked away. So that's really it for the inside of this machine. It seems pretty well built. Like everything is very sturdy. Nothing is flimsy at all. It's quite heavy. And all of the peripherals and the cards and everything were screwed in in a very secure fashion and nothing was loose. All right, it's time to give this thing a test. Now, I don't wanna just try it with this original power supply in here. I don't really, A, trust that this works properly, but B, if there's a shorted tantalum on the motherboard, that could damage this power supply as well. So I'm gonna plug in my regular AT power supply that I test with everything, because that thing is um, kind of a workhorse. I've abused the crap out of it, and it, I know if it gets shorted out, it doesn't get damaged from that. It just shuts off, which is the desirable thing. Here's the power supply I was talking about. This thing's a workhorse. It's also nice that this has a really nice long power supply connector, so it's easy to test stuff like this. I could just run the power supply off to the side and it works well. What I also like about this power supply is it has no problem running with no load. And earlier power supplies from the 80s often needed some kind of a load on them to regulate properly. So you couldn't just run them with, say, just a floppy drive or something. But this one has no problem at all. So I have no issues running the motherboard on this machine without any other peripherals connected compared to the original power supply that might possibly need the load of a floppy drive or a hard drive or whatever connected to it. So just be careful if you're testing really old power supplies to not just run them with nothing connected. It can cause them to over voltage or under voltage in ways that can be bad. For the initial smoke test of this machine, I'm gonna plug in my post card. And yes, this is called a post card, P-O-S-T. And that's because on 286 ATs and later, it will actually display a uh, status code right here on this two digit uh, numeric display to tell you what's happening with the computer. So if it's not booting, say you give it a black screen, maybe it's partially booting and it's getting stuck somewhere. Now on an original XT or an XT clone, it's not gonna have support postcodes. So this is not gonna show anything, but it does have LEDs here showing all the voltage rails. So we can kind of see if at least that's working properly. All right, I have the power switch here. I know you can't really see these LEDs very well, but I'm gonna keep my eye on them. There we go. It's actually, see it's showing a FF here on the display, so that's not really working. But we heard a beep, which implies that this motherboard is working. I've gone ahead and I've reinstalled the video card that was in this machine. And for further testing, I'm gonna use this, which is the RGB to HDMI that I'm typically using. Now I recently was testing this on something. What was it? Oh, it was that uh, PCXT that I fixed the capacitor on the motherboard that was keeping it from turning on. And it wasn't working with monochrome cards. Well, it turned out that the CPLD that's running on this little device here that's plugged into the Raspberry Pi, it was damaged. And the input pin that is used on this nine pin connector for the monochrome video signal actually wasn't working at all. So with the original board in here on a monochrome card or Hercules, you'd get a black screen, but on the CGA, it would work fine. So I've gone ahead and I've swapped out the board for one that works. And then Aaron over at Retro Hack Shack is sending me a new CPLD to swap out with the bad one on that other board so I can uh, get this thing working again with the original board. Now I cannot say enough good things about RGB to HDMI. It is such a great project when you have these old machines and you need HDMI up conversion. 
say you don't have the original monitor for something like an old PC like this, well, the RGB to HDMI is your ticket. For me, I'm using it, of course, for my videos here because I capture the HDMI so everyone can see the output of the machines. But I wouldn't normally do that because I have the original monitor even for this machine, which may work. We'll test that in a little bit. But a lot of people aren't lucky enough to have the original monitors. And for CGA, EGA, monochrome, Hercules, all that stuff, the RGB to HDMI is a fantastic solution to give you pixel-perfect display. And I was recently working with Ian, who's the maintainer of the project, RGB to HDMI project, to refine and really dial in all the monochrome and Hercules profiles that were on this thing. If we go into the menu and we look at the profile here, and there's gonna be several in here. So there's Hercules. The Hercules and the monochrome profiles, which are these two, were never quite right on the configuration. So you get like flashing screens or it would be misaligned or whatever. It just wasn't quite right. So I found all the monochrome and Hercules cards that I could get my hands on and I went through and I tested all of them and I fine tuned these. So now if you have an RGB to HDMI or you buy one, go download the very latest release of the software and put it on the SD card. And that means you'll be using those latest profiles that I made to get the perfect image on your monochrome card with the RGB to HDMI. Oh, and I wanna add one more thing about the RGB to HDMI. It's a fully open source project, so if you wanna make one yourself, you can download all this, the PCB designs, have them made, soldered up, everything. But if you wanna purchase a pre-assembled one, I'll put some links in the description that of the time of this video, there are actually some available for you to buy. Okay, so I have the profile here set for Hercules, because I think that's maybe closest enough to what this card is. And let's power it up, see what happens. Okay, so there it is, and it looks pixel perfect using the Hercules profile. Not all monochrome cards use the exact right timing, so they don't always match, but uh, there's a few in there now. I think I have like NEC, um, Video 7 maybe, MDA, which is IBM card, and then also Hercules. And usually with one of those, you're gonna find one that works perfectly. Otherwise, you're gonna need to tweak it a little bit. They're all similar enough. But we can see here, we have a Phoenix BIOS 2.13 from 1985, keyboard bad, 640K. What happened to that extra memory? It may still be there. It just might be jumpered out or the BIOS only checks to 640 and doesn't actually go any higher than that. So that RAM is just mapped into upper memory somewhere. Now I forgot to plug the power connector into the floppy drive. So let me do that because obviously the floppy drive is plugged into the motherboard already. Like I didn't take out the disc controller because there is no disc controller to take out. All right, the power cable is connected to the floppy drive. Let's plug in this XT keyboard because it's uh, Happens to be the one I have handy. And now let's give this a power. I saw a flash there. Keyboard bad. Well, that's interesting on the switch on the back is, oh. <laughs> so that would be a tantalum that just shorted. <laughs> and the power supply shut off. It's why I like this power supply because uh, it has good short protection. And it looks like right there is the bad tantalum that just shorted. The little top is blown off on it. Well, unfortunately, tantalum caps have a failure mode that is a short circuit. And that can cause issues with your power supply because if it does get damaged from a short, it can also burn traces on the motherboard depending on how much current the power supply can output. Now, the one thing to consider is that these tantalums on here all could potentially fail but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are gonna fail. And unlike say electrolytics, which leak all over your board, these will just short. The smaller ones, which are bypass caps for all of these uh, five volt chips here, these can also short as well. But typically when they do, there's a lot of current on the five volt rail. Uh, those will just sort of like, you'll see little burn marks on them and they fail short and then they open because they burn out, they get so hot. But the 12 volt ones, and these are gonna be minus 12 and plus 12 volts, these, these tantalums along here for the cards, those rails aren't used anywhere else on the PC. They're only gonna be used on the ISA slots. Those seem to be a little bit more resilient. So when they short, it actually causes the computer not to work anymore. So I'm gonna take the brute force approach and I'm gonna to try to just cut this tantalum right out of here. I'm leaving those legs in there just so I can more easily solder a replacement onto them. But there's that little pinhole mark. Hopefully you can see that clearly. That would have been the little pop that blew off uh, this shorted tantalum here. So with the video card back in there and the RGB to HDMI reconnected to it, I'd say that this machine should start working again. I mean, the keyboard was complaining it was bad. I don't think that's an unrelated problem. See, there we go. It powered right back up again. And yes, it still says keyboard bad. Oh, you know what? Part of the reason for that is I did unplug it. 
Let's see if this, uh, no, it just says 39 keyboard bad, push F1. It's accessing the disk drive. All right, I think I see the problem here. It's saying disk boot failure, type any key to retry, and it keeps actually retrying the boot process. I bet you this keyboard has a stuck key on it. None of the keys are actually stuck though. Why don't I take this opportunity to pop one of these keycaps off and let's look at what's underneath here. Let's see if there's any kind of mechanical keyboard going on. Yeah, I'm not too sure what we're looking at here. Looks like it's got a key switch, but I don't know if it's rubber dome just underneath or a membrane or something like that. It makes sense if it's membrane that there's some like gunk or dirt stuck in there, which is causing one of the keys to be held down all the time. At least the keycaps appear to be double shot, uh, probably ABS here, which is why it's yellowed. All right, I grabbed another XT keyboard. This is the one I typically use. Pretty sure this one is gonna work without issue. Control delete does reboot and no more keyboard bad message. All right, we're getting disk boot failure, type any key to retry. Let's take a look at this disk drive before I try to read a disk in it. All right, so to fix the gummed up feeling when you move the lever, I took a little bit of this bearing oil here and I just put a couple drops right at the spots where this shaft passes through the chassis. So there's one there, there's one there, I don't think you could see and I put a little drop there. And then I used a, a cotton swab just to clean up any excess because I don't want the oil dripping down onto the floppy disk when you put it in. And now if we stick a random floppy disk in there, like that, now this is really nice and smooth. Now the one thing that has me a little bit worried is that there was no seeking of this drive from the BIOS. Now that might be normal. Maybe this particular clone, clone BIOS doesn't actually seek this drive but it does have me slightly worried that the head mechanism is sort of stuck. So I'm gonna shut the power off and we're just gonna to try to move this. Oh yeah, that's not moving at all. So I'm gonna use this screwdriver here and I'm just going to try to move the head. Okay, it's moving. Okay, I think what's happening, okay, it's a little more freed up now. I don't think the motor is gummed up. I think these two rods are gummed up. So now with the camera reposition, you can see one of the rods right there and there's one on the other side as well. There's a little bearing or like a bushing that this sled slides on. So I'm just gonna put a little drop of lubricant right there and a similar position there. And then I'm gonna start moving this manually. And you have to do this when the power is off because when the drive is powered up, it typically sort of holds this stepper motor in position and it's much harder to move. So just shut the power off and, and it will move much more easily. So I'm gonna use this bearing oil again. And I can't remember where I got this. I think it's really designed for HVAC motors to put inside the bearings for your heating and cooling system. But I, I find it works pretty well. I'm just gonna put a little bit of this on a cotton swab here. That's gonna allow me to more strategically put it onto the rail here. So like that, and on this side as well. Luckily, it does not look like it's too rusted up or anything. Now, if you're trying to free up the heads that are seem stuck like this one was, don't try to move it by this part here. This is all very fragile. Try to turn the stepper motor manually. And this is now moving much more freely. All right, I'm gonna say this feels about normal. There's always a little bit of resistance inside a stepper motor, but the head is moving nice and freely now. All right, I'm gonna turn the power back on. Let's see if the head moves. Nope, it didn't. It definitely is connected to power, but the light is on and it actually is spinning. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this cleaning floppy here and we're just gonna give this thing a little bit of a clean. So slide this in, hopefully that starts spinning it. There it goes. So now it's doing the cleaning. Now, if you don't have a cleaning disc, just use some 99% IPA and very carefully clean the heads. You have to be extremely careful because the top head, especially on a double-sided disc drive like this, can be easily uh, knocked out and damaged. Okay, here is a copy of MS-DOS 3.3. This will be a 360K disc, which is what this drive is. Sounds like it's working. I was a bit too slow moving the camera, but it has booted into DOS. I'm gonna type DIR. And it is showing the directory. Let's run the mode command. There we go. See, it's working nicely. All right, so the motherboard is working, the floppy drive is working. What's next? The hard drive. Let's see if this thing works. It's not uncommon for mini scribe drives to have a head stepper that's gummed up as well. Sort of like the floppy drive, except in the hard drive, it actually is the motor itself, the stepper motor that jams up. 
and I'm pretty sure it's gonna be right underneath this cover here. We'd have to remove this drive to try to apply a little bit of that same bearing oil to this. So let's see if this even spins. Okay, it's spinning up. Sounds like it's okay, like it's working. All right, so time to put this controller back in here. Let's see if this mini scribe drive can actually read. Maybe there's interesting programs on this machine. I don't necessarily think there is. It may just be completely uh, boring stuff like WordPerfect and that's it, which is probably all that's on here. Okay, so it's just sitting here and I have a feeling, oh, one hard drive, okay. Now it's trying to boot off the floppy drive, which you can't see if the light is on. Uh, whoa, we booted. We got MS-DOS version 3.2, R3.03. All right, what do we have on here? We have floppies, WP directory with a WordPerfect batch file, the park.com, let's run that. Should park the hard drive, there it is, parked it. I wonder what T8 and T5 is. I would not be surprised that that sets the speed of this computer to 4.77 megahertz and eight megahertz. So let's do T5. System clock frequency, 4.77 megahertz. Now, if we do DIR, we we'll look at how quickly it's drawing the text, not super fast. And if we go T8, now set to eight megahertz. Much, much faster. You can see the speed difference right there. Okay, back to the root directory. That's about it on this machine. There's nothing else on here. It's unfortunately a little bit boring. I ran WordPerfect on here. It absolutely works fine. I ran a few other little programs. I loaded the odd file and uh, it's working. This drive is functional, which is pretty amazing to me. So really excited about that. Let me just run check disk here so we can see how large this hard drive is, but I'm gonna be guessing that it is 20 megabytes or 21 megabytes or so. You'd almost think that the noise this is making now implies that there's some kind of a problem with this uh, hard drive. I don't think so. I think that's just, just the way this old version of check disk goes through and validates the fat tables and whatever else. And there it is, 21 million total bytes. So just as I thought, that's 20 or so megabytes, just like uh, an ST225 Seagate drive. Okay, so for running check disk on this machine, I'm gonna put in my XT IDE here. I think this should work. We'll be able to know pretty quickly if it's running at 4.77. Oh, it is running at 8 megahertz. The default speed is turbo. There it is, a little bit of an improvement. Okay, I'm gonna put this orange disc in the drive here because I wanna run a diagnostic on the floppy drive just so we can verify that it is working perfectly. Now, what I like about the check disc floppy drive test is it just does random seeks and will report a read error. So it exercises the head too. And now that I lubricated those little sliders, just make sure that the head assembly and everything is moving properly. If there's any issues with that being gummed up, it will reveal itself in here. There we go, it passed. Okay, so this drive is absolutely working perfectly. All right, I am gonna dump the ROMs here using ROM Dumper. This will just save these ROMs onto the machine. I'm gonna make a MyTAC directory and I'm gonna move these ROM files into there. But I'm gonna delete D1000 because that is XTIDE, which does not matter. All right, I'm gonna go back in to check it because I am curious to see, I'm gonna plug that original keyboard back in, which key is actually stuck. And there's a keyboard test routine in here under input devices. And we have an 83 key keyboard is what we're testing. So I'm gonna unplug this keyboard. I'm gonna hot swap it while the machine is on. And, and I'm gonna make sure not to hold down any keys on here while I plug this into the machine. All right, and look at that. It detected the space bar as the key that's pushed down. And it's definitely not pushed right now. It's, it's up like it should be, but it's detecting that as the key that is stuck. All right, what's left to do now is test out this internal power supply because it seems like everything else on this machine is working perfectly. And I'm gonna grab the multimeter here. We'll just uh, stick this into one of the leads here so we can get an idea of what the voltages are like on this. Now, remember I said, don't run these power supplies without any load on them at all. They generally aren't gonna work right, or they might work, but you're gonna have weird voltage readings. So if we turn this on now, 5.04 volts, the machine is running. That looks good. The fan is noisy and horrible sounding, but that's pretty typical. And we're getting 12.1. So this power supply working nicely. Fan just sounds horrible. 
And now the very last thing to test is that monitor that this came with. I put the top cover back on just so we can more easily take a look at the monitor here before we first try to power it up. This is a normal monochrome monitor, so it would plug right into the back of that card. And as I had mentioned, the power input is actually a cable that plugs in the back of the power supply, so the monitor turns on when the computer does. We have a power switch here. There is a brightness and a contrast knob here, and you can see <laughs> where this has been adjusted forever because it's quite yellow in one spot. It's almost like someone never changed any of these, although actually the contrast knob, the yellowing is a little bit more sporadic, so maybe someone was adjusting that over time. The fact that the rest of this is not yellowed implies that this is painted, and that's why this thing doesn't have any yellowing at all except for these knobs here. And on the back we have an MDEC 12-inch data display model 410A for amber, I think. 310 is the older style that I've shown on the channel before. Clint over at LGR had a brand new 310A, which he bought new old stock and unboxed on his channel. Pretty cool. So this is the later one, which looks a little bit less distinctive and a little bit more boring than that older one. It does have a date here of June 1987, so that sort of implies when this entire computer was manufactured and purchased. Vertical size, vertical hold, and H-center control, although only one sticks through the back, there are two, you have to stick a tool into the monitor to make those adjustments. All right, we're ready for the smoke test of the monitor. I, I'm gonna turn off the power on it. So I, th I think it's off. You know, to be honest, you can't tell. I think that's off right now. Here we go. Okay, computer's turning on. I do have it hooked up to both the monitor and the RGB to HDMI. I just have a little splitter cable. So let's see what happens. The light's on. Oh, there it is. It was just very slow to warm up. It looks pretty dim, as I would expect for a monitor of this age. Probably got used a whole lot. And then, of course, this dirty screen cover here almost certainly dims it out. All right, I'm going to run David Murray's Planet X3. It's probably the first time a game has ever been run on this machine. Its entire life was just used for word processing. We're going to pick Hercules 2 Color 7 PC Speaker. There it is. It's running. Oh, we got burn-in. A lot of burn-in here. Yep. So right here, you can see the burn-in. This gives away how much usage this monitor actually had over the years. Lots and lots of burn-in there on every line. That's just text characters. Not even graphics, just text. Now, zooming out, here's Planet X3. Of course, it's working just fine with no issues. And of course, on the RGB to HDMI, you can see I have a nice pixel perfect image as well. I do have the brightness and contrast maxed out right now on this monitor, and it is this dim. And the funny thing is the yellowing on these knobs here, if I turn it, you'll see, notice it's actually not very yellowed. It looks like this monitor was more at like this position for its entire life, which still produces a useful image, although that is quite dark. If I max this out again, at least it's a little bit better. I've brought up the MS-DOS edit program here just so we can see that burn-in. Notice how it exists right over here on this side, and it's not burned in here. And that's, of course, because of the formatting of WordPerfect. It always line-wrapped around here. I am somewhat surprised by all of this because, of course, like I mentioned, the dust inside this machine was so minimal, but this amount of burn-in would only happen after a lot of usage. I did copy the utilities off for changing the speed of this machine uh, onto my compact flash card here. So if you are looking for these, uh, let me know in the comment section below. Well, that's gonna be it for this PC Archaeology episode. I apologize that this wasn't more interesting, but like I said at the beginning, I just don't know when I start out with one of these things. This MyTac PC is just a perfect example of by the late 80s, how PCs were just so commoditized and that these inexpensive turbo clones were just a great way to get a very solidly built PC that had an upgrade possibility. Like you could have swapped out the motherboard, you could have put a color video card in there, got rid of this monitor. You know, there's lots of options with machines like this. And that's what made these PCs so cool at the time. And I think there was a huge savings with these over an IBM. But obviously whoever bought this thing just used it for one thing and that's WordPerfect and it probably worked perfectly for them. Clearly this thing is solidly built and works well. It's in amazing shape and it works absolutely perfectly. Well, other than of course that bad tantalum, which I just cut out and the floppy drive, which needed a little help working again, but 
probably hasn't been used in forever. And even before, it was probably only used for the hard drive and no one ever used a disk drive anyway. So it just sat there idle and it got sort of gummed up. So that is going to be it for this video. If you liked it, you know what to do. Thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. All the usual. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. If you want to become a patron to get early access to videos and other special content, there are links in the description below. Don't forget to check out my second channel if you haven't already. And I do have a merch store which has t-shirts right now. So if you want to see those and buy an Adrian Sigil Basement t-shirt, you can do so. And that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. And I will see you next time. Bye.